Is it just me or is the, are the seats extra squeaky today? Extra? You think so? All right. How's everybody feeling this morning? I'm starting to feel tired. How many of you are tired? Okay, good. How many of you are like, yeah, but we got this. Okay, uh, good. We'll try to have more hands. We won't, we'll, yeah. We're going to be okay. So you try to listen up as well as you can. I'll try to be as clear and as interesting and helpful as I can. These last few days of chapel, we're going to be teasing out some implications of what it means that God has always had His plan to live with His people and that that is where everything is going. And that by His grace, as we talked about yesterday, we have a place in that story. And we have that place now under the New Covenant, right? When the curtain has been torn, when we have access to the holy places through the blood of Jesus. And knowing that, knowing God's presence in our lives by the presence of the Holy Spirit in us should change us. It should make a difference. God doesn't just save and forgive sinners. He changes them. He makes His home with us. And the fact that He makes His home with us should change the way we think about who we are, should change the way we live. So if you have your Bible, please turn to Hebrews 13 today, the very last chapter. It's probably about a page over from where I had you turn yesterday. And just to kind of keep it going, we won't actually read these verses until uh, late in the message today, but we will look at some that are actually just a bit before it. So, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 will be the verses that we read a little bit later. This morning, I want us to think together about God's fear-inducing and fear-banishing presence in our lives. Right? We come to God, and that should make us afraid. Not only because of our sin, but just because of who He is and who we are. There is a great distance between Him, His being, His character, and who we are. And that should lead us to awe. And then knowing that this God is with us and for us and in us should banish all fear of anything or anyone else from our lives. So today, that's what we want to think about. Being in awe of the God who is graciously with us. And that His presence with us is what keeps us from being afraid of anyone or anything. What are you afraid of? That's not a question for you to answer out loud right now. But it's something for you to think of. What do you fear? Whether it's about what's coming today. Whether it's about what's coming next week when we're not at Chehi anymore. Maybe it's next month. When, I know I shouldn't say this as summer camp when school starts. I know. I know. I'm sorry. It's coming nonetheless. What is it that you are afraid of, whether it's circumstances, people, events, failure, maybe that's what drives you and why you work so hard, I can't mess up, I can't let certain people in my life down, kind of flipping fear the other way, so we'll think about that, we also want to flip fear the other way, when the Bible's talking about the fear of God, there is a whoa. Right? But there's also an awe in His presence just because of who He is. His greatness, His brightness, His glory. And when we realize that this God is with us, we stand in awe of Him and not really in awe of anyone else. Who is the person, and you can, you can answer this one out loud if you want to, who is the person that if you could meet them, you would just absolutely melt. I came up with a few names. For the cellist, maybe it's Yo-Yo Ma. 
right? If you could like sit down and talk with Yo-Yo Ma, like what would you even say, right? Be like, I'm really good. No, that doesn't work. For the violinist, perhaps Joshua Bell. We got to see Joshua Bell when he was in Philly earlier this year. And maybe there are younger ones that, that, uh, that you know and that you're like, yes. Maybe it's not a classical musician at all. Uh, one of the ones for some in our family, and uh, I think Liz is wearing the shirt today, is the Grey Havens. Okay? If you could like, meet the Grey Havens, and we actually got to a couple months ago. We went to one of their concerts. It was at a church that's in our uh, tiny denomination. And uh, I know a guy, not the Grey Havens, but a guy. And he can text the Grey Havens because they know him. He's like, hey, my friends are going to be at your thing. They really want to meet you, their son. Some of you may have known if you've walked through the great room while the guitar's out. <laughs> that somebody in our family really, 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 really loves the Grey Havens and thinks they're the only band in the world, and he's wrong, and you can help him. <laughs> I know, that was a deep cut. And we got to meet them. Like, in a dark corner of a hallway. It was really actually kind of weird. But it was also awesome, right? Right? Bobby and Kara, you were there. You can back me up on this. Right? We're there, and we're, like, talking with them. And all of a sudden, they're, like, asking our oldest daughter about where she's going to college and what she wants to study. And we're like, what is happening right now? Right? Because it was amazing. And we had to prepare Bobby for weeks for this. <laughs> Am I wrong? Okay, it's true. It's all true. Right? Because he's like, I mean, I'm excited, but I'm not sure I really want to meet them because I just don't know what I'm going to do when I get there. Right? Because I don't know if I'll be able to stand it. Okay? There are some people, whether it's because they make great music, or sometimes it's their physical presence, sometimes they make great music and have an incredible physical presence. Um... I mentioned uh, yesterday, talking about my friend Tim, that we met singing in an opera. That opera is Fidelio, Beethoven's um, opera that makes uh, mezzos out of sopranos. <laughs> and the soprano, it did not make a mezzo out of her. Uh, we would bring in, so students would participate, uh, graduate students would participate, Faculty and staff would participate, and then we would bring in guest artists for the lead roles from like the Met. And so the soprano, I don't remember her name, she was a guest artist. She was 6'6". Six, six. Uh, I'm 6'1". Uh, Jonathan, how tall are you? 6'5". Okay, so think Jonathan, but like fully stretched out, right? As tall as possible. He's sitting up straighter now. This is great. Um, think Jonathan, completely stretched out like you're going to sing as tall as you can, right? And then think of him about three times thicker. Okay? And that's not a fat joke. She wasn't fat. Opera singers, like, you, if you're going to do what they do, generally you have to be built a certain way. It's just the way that it works. Okay? So she's, and he's also super skinny. All right? So uh, I ended up through God's providence, and last year when I was talking about God's providence, told that story of how messing things up actually led to ending up having a very tiny solo in this opera. My mom was so proud. My name was in the program just as much as any of the guest artists were once. She probably still has it at home somewhere. It was like eight measures. So it was, yeah, but it was, it was all by myself, right? It's like, yay! Uh, I didn't sing it like that. But, and the main thing I remember from that is how afraid I was of the maestro because my German was not, there was one word that I could not get, and it was not good enough. And when the maestro stops you at the 
big rehearsals, right, when the orchestra is in the pit and all the singers are there for all three acts and all the stage crew is there. You know, it's like, great, I have a solo. And it's like, wait, they stopped everything because of me. And this soprano who had this presence and had an amazing voice, and just for those of you who are, because you know, uh, sopranos always end up with like a love interest. Well, whether it doesn't work out very well or not is not really important in, in uh, opera. Uh, and whether they actually meet until the third act isn't super important in opera either. But there's a love interest and they have to look right together. So somehow they got a tenor who was 6'9". So, so it actually worked. It worked great. We just tried to not stand too close to them the rest of the time so you wouldn't realize how tall they were. But we have, in one of the last rehearsals where everyone's there, we have a cast party. And there's some light refreshments, and it's like on the stage in the auditorium there at our school. And I'm talking with a friend of mine that's in the chorus with me, and I get a tap on the shoulder, and I turn around, and it's her. And I'm like, I'm looking in the wrong place. <laughs> And I'm just like, I'm in awe, right? And she says, I just wanted to tell you what a good job that I thought you did. I was like, oh. <laughs> and it's, I still, I'm describing it to you. That was in 1998. Uh, and I, I'm feeling all the feelings right now <laughs> from that moment. And she's just a person. She was a great singer. And she had a great physical presence. The Grey Havens are just a couple, just a couple of people who are trying to be good parents and good Christians and make some good music. That's really all they are. If we can feel that kind of awe for people who are just like us, really, what kind of awe should we feel for the God who made us? The God who is over all, the God who is so far beyond us that we cannot comprehend Him, the God whom we have rebelled against, but who has come after us in love. I'm feeling all those feelings just from talking about meeting a person. Are you aware that God is closer to you than that soprano was to me? And closer to you than we were to the Grey Havens a couple months ago. At the end of chapter 12, as he's describing, we, we're not coming to the old mountain, Mount Sinai. We're coming to the new Jerusalem. We're coming with all the innumerable saints and angels. And we're coming to God. As he's, again, comparing the old covenant with the new in verses 28 and 29 of chapter 12, they might even be on the same page for you as where you are in Hebrews 13. It says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Awe should lead to worship. And we cannot stand before this consuming fire apart from Christ. We come to God. And He wants us to come to Him. He calls us to come to Him. We come to Him through Christ Jesus. So that as we saw from Hebrews 10, we can actually come with confidence into the holy places. To be with Him. To worship Him. We worship through Christ Jesus and we worship in the power and at the direction of the Holy Spirit. And that kind of worship is meant to glorify Christ. To show who He is. His beauty. His grace. His love. This is the goal of Sundays. And it's why hopefully the churches that you're a part of, the people who are responsible for planning the liturgy, Plan it very carefully and very intentionally, choosing readings and prayers and songs that will point us to Jesus and cause us to see how great God is and how small we are. It's the point of reading your Bible and 
praying in the morning or whatever time of day is your time that's set aside to meet with God. It's the goal of Sundays. It ought to be the goal of every day. And so we need everyday liturgies to remind us of God's love for us, His grace toward us through Jesus, and His presence with us by the Holy Spirit. We need everyday liturgies that remind us of this. And we need not just daily, like in the morning reminders of this, because how quickly do we forget? It's one of the reasons that we pray at meals, right? It's not so the food doesn't go bad, right? If you ever, it's like, oh, you didn't pray for that, right? It's not so much for the food. What are we doing when we pray at meals? And even when we pray here at the end of meals, it's an acknowledgement. God, you're here. You're at work. You're gracious to us. We love you. We're grateful to you. And praying at meals is just a way to stop in your day and say, where does all this come from? And what is all this about? It's why in chamber choir yesterday, she had us pray at the beginning. She said, we need a little of God's peace today. Let's pray. Prayer is talking to him, but prayer is also aligning us, realigning us. Because like a vehicle, we tend to go out of alignment, but we go out of alignment a lot faster than cars do. We can go out of alignment in a moment, right? When you feel overwhelmed and you feel like we're never going to get this piece done by Saturday. And maybe some of you are feeling that. We're at kind of the point in the week where we feel that way, right? It's too many. It's too much. It's impossible. I'm tired. I can't focus. What do we need in that moment? Because those choices actually aren't up to us. What can we do? Where are we right now? And what do we need? And we can stop. And so yes, there's times when you bow your head and close your eyes to pray. But the Lord who is with you, who is in you, He can hear you if you're praying with your eyes wide open, asking for His help with a passage that's difficult. And He's ready and eager to hear from us as we walk in the fear of Him. As we stand in awe of Him. And this fear-inducing God, His fear-inducing presence, is ultimately what leads us not to be afraid of anything else. His presence with us is what gives us the confidence to fight the battles that we face. Under the Old Covenant, this looked like literal battles. And so again, uh, my Bible reading from yesterday. It's talking about King Asa and following the Lord. Actually, this one was probably Abijah, the one that that I'm picking from here. And they had half as many men in the army as the army that they were going against. The other army had a better strategy, had people in front of them, and behind them. And what did they do? They cried to the Lord. And because we're in music camp, the next words in the passage say, and the priests blew the trumpets. So trumpeters, you're right there, fighting the Lord's battles. It's like, yes, all right. So under the Old Covenant, that meant they would win literal battles. And all of a sudden, where all the math was against them, all the strategy was against them, and God provided the victory so that it was clear it was Him. He loves to get glory that way. To work through things and people who are weak, who are small, who are inconsequential. And if that sounds like a letter to the Corinthians, that's on purpose. So they fought literal battles. We don't fight very many literal battles today, and especially not like on behalf of the Lord. Right? We're fighting spiritual battles against spiritual wickedness in high places. And we don't have to be afraid because He is with us. And He loves to use the ones who are small and weak and seemingly unimportant because He gets the most glory that way. Because if we... Win a battle, and it's like, of course I was. I'm the best. 
we're missing something really important. <laughs> it's God who is at work. And it's through Him, through His presence with us that we win the spiritual battles that we face today. Also under the Old Covenant, remember as they were traveling to Egypt, and we mentioned this earlier in the week, that God said, I'm not going to go up with you because I'll consume you on the way because of the wickedness of this people. And Moses said, God, if I don't want the promised land without you. I don't want the promised land without you. And for us, we can think of the promised land as heaven, or hopefully slightly adjusted to the new heavens and the new earth. But even then, it's like, would we want all of that? And we wouldn't really need God because we have everything we've ever wanted. And I don't know what those things are for each individual here, right? Maybe it's a career in music. Maybe it's a career as a music teacher. Maybe it's just making it to Saturday. You're like, I don't have goals that lofty. I'm just trying to survive this week. And that's okay too. But whatever those goals are, whatever for you feels like a promised land, a little short of the actual promised land, if you could have that, And God would be absent. Would you be like, yeah, I'll take that deal because this is what I really want. Maybe our hearts need adjusted. Because now God's presence is with us by His Holy Spirit and we will be with Him forever. So let's read now Hebrews 13, 5 and six connects to what we were just saying. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. So growing up, I probably would have stopped reading there. It's like, there's things I need to do. Maybe you relate to God's word that way too. We've got rules, we gotta keep them. If you're discontent, hey, figure it out, get content. You need to do it. Stop whining. We don't whine here at Chehi. There's no crying in baseball. There's some crying at Chehi. but not for long, right? We don't have time for that. Thankfully, that is not how your counselors relate to you, right? Because they know that the rules aren't just rules. And that the Bible doesn't stop there. Keep your life free from love of money, it says, and be content with what you have. Why? For He, God, has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? If we have God, even if we never get the chair we wanted, we can't lose. Even if we never make the top band or the top orchestra or the one we always dreamed of, we can't lose. We have Him. And you might say, I don't make any money. My life is totally free of the love of money. And maybe you say, well, I've lived long enough to know that you really need it, and so I'm already kind of on that bandwagon, even if I still don't have any money myself yet. But what's going on with love of money? It's really the love of what money can do for you. There's not too many people like Scrooge McDuck who just love swimming in their gold. What does money do for you? It promises peace and security. It promises being able to get what you want and to get what you need when you need it. And that seems good. And that's why the love of money is a big problem even for people who think they don't have a problem with the love of money. But what's the solution to that? What's the solution to all the fears that we have if we feel like we don't have enough? It's the Lord saying, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am always with you. And so we can confidently say, I don't have anything to be afraid of. There is nothing 
to fear. When we know God is with us, when we know he is on our side, we do not have to be afraid. We do a vacation Bible school every year. Two weeks ago was our vacation Bible school at our church, and it is always an absolute blast. Ten years ago, the Chick-fil-A cow came to our vacation Bible school. We have a really good, I know, right? We have a really good relationship with our local Chick-fil-A because uh, I might have spent enough time there for him to think I was running a side business instead of just meeting with people from my church and in the community. Um, and we ask them for a donation, and they're like, sure, we'll bring some chicken nuggets, and we'll bring the cow. It's like, awesome. Kids love the cow, except for the ones who don't. So how many of you, now think back to your like three and four year old self. I know that's hard because you guys are all so old. How many of you would say, Chick-fil-A cow shows up, I'm there, I'm in line to get a hug from the Chick-fil-A cow, I am pumped. Okay? And we had many. We have, we have pictorial evidence of kids who were really excited about that. And that was actually the majority. How many of you would say, if the Chick-fil-A cow was coming toward me, I would be running the other direction. Okay, I see that. And I appreciate, I appreciate all your honesty. And we did have one uh, who maybe raised their hand just now. Bob, you don't have to look like that. <laughs> who was deathly afraid. And she'll tell you all about it, right, Kara? But most of it, that was actually a majority who can identify with that, right? It's like, it's big. It's scary. It's coming at me. What's it going to do? You know, it's just a person in a suit, right? And they're paid to do it. They're probably making like $10 an hour, maybe a little more at Chick-fil-A. But you're scared to death, right? And the thing that made it okay, because this is outside at the, where we had the games and snacks, and everyone's crowded around the cow, and then there's one little girl, like, way on the other side, and the workers are like, I don't know what to do, what are we going to do with her? What ultimately made it okay was that I was free in that moment and came out and joined her. Dad can take the Chick-fil-A cow. I knew I didn't need to. <laughs> But for a three-year-old, who's like, that's the scariest thing I've ever been close to, and I don't want to do that, and I don't want to go back with the group, is the cow gone? What made her okay? I was there. Once I was there, the tears stopped. She was willing to move a little bit closer. She wasn't so afraid anymore. I have one more related to that. This, a friend of mine took his son when he was three to Citizens Bank Park where the Phillies play. And it was one of those days where after the game, the kids get to run around the bases. Okay? But his son was three. Three's a little small to leave dad at the gate and go out on the field by yourself and run around the bases. But that's how it's supposed to be. Kids are supposed to go by themselves. And he's there at the gate. And the dad wants this. You cannot understand how much, unless you know him, you cannot understand how much this dad wants his son to run around the bases at the Phillies. He loves all the Philly sports, wants his son to own it too. Here we are, and now his son's scared. And he won't go. And he won't let go of dad. And he's asking the guards at the place, you know, can, can I just go out there with him? Secretly, he really wanted to run the bases himself. That's what was actually going on. But for the sake of the story, he says, can I go with him? I'm like, no, you can't go with him. He's like, but he's scared. He's not going to go. Says, okay, great. You know, you're holding up the line. Just get out of our way. And so they go. And at first, the little boy's, you know, holding on to his dad's hand. And he's going kind of timidly. And he gets past first base. And by the time he's rounding second, he's like, I got this. I can do this. And that fear 
turned to an incredible confidence. And he was flying as fast as a three-year-old can fly, flying around the bases by the end. All the fear was gone. All the joy was present. The smile was huge. It's a great memory. And 20 years later, a great sermon illustration. He went from fearful, afraid, to confident, to tackle the task in front of him that felt impossible. He felt there's no way I can do that. But he had his dad. And his dad was holding his hand. And he could do anything. See also the way the Bible wraps up? Jesus wins. He wins. And we're with Him. We're on His side. And He is with us. And we win with and through Him. So no matter how dark or dangerous things or people or situations look, we never have to be afraid. Because Jesus is with us. We never have to be afraid. So yes, read your Bible. Pray. Gather with your church to worship the Lord. Pay attention at devotions tonight. Participate in sing time with all your heart. But don't leave God in those places. He's with you every moment of every day. Ask Him for help, for wisdom, for strength, for boldness, for humility, for grace. Ask Him to guide you into what's true by His Spirit. See and acknowledge His work in you and His peace with you. That as you stand of awe in Him, you don't have to fear anyone or anything else. I want to close this morning with a Trinitarian benediction from the end of 2 Corinthians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless you.